Greetings. I bring you greetings in the matchless name of my Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Reverend Bob Lico, God's own honey badger, bringing you another teaching on the provision of our loving and caring Heavenly Father. And this one I entitle, Our God Will Provide for His People in Plagues. As we looked at in the first teaching, we noted again that God uses four things to judge His people and rebellious humanity. He uses drought and plague, pestilence, the sword, and wild beasts and animals to judge his people. And we looked at in the first presentation that he would provide for us and can provide for us miraculously and supernaturally in times of drought and famine and lack of food and supplies, that the God that we love and serve is more than able to multiply what little food we have, little oil we have, to create food out of nothing, to bring food even in the mouth of a raven at one point. Yes, the Lord our God provides for his people, and we can trust him to meet our every need. And this includes in the area of plague and pestilence. My goodness, the whole world is undergoing currently the first phase of a global pandemic. COVID is not the, in quotes, disease X that many uh, conspiracy followers have talked about and, and some Bible teachers and others. No, this is not it. It is a precursor. It has weakened much of humanity and the shots have weakened uh, many, many more. And so we have a perfect setup for another more deadly pandemic. And I believe that it's going to jump over from the uh, so-called avian bird flu uh, it's already been weaponized, that specific H1N1, H1N5, those viruses have been weaponized by the Gates Foundations and others. So I fully expect a much more severe and deadly global pandemic right around the corner. But when the current pestilence, COVID-19, started, I wrote a long article in Truth Matters, our monthly newsletter that our ministry, Discernment Ministry International, has published for over 20 years, and we send first class to all of those who are subscribed to it. And I covered in one of those issues during the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I wrote a very long article on Psalm 91. And I'm going to read Psalm 91 very quickly and briefly just as a reminder. And it's an encouragement to our faith. And this is the whole point of this teaching is to encourage all of us to grow in our faith in our God, to trust him, not only for our daily bread, but for our physical healing. I begin reading Psalm 91 from the King James Version. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth 
at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, this is certainly not a teaching on Psalm 91, but how beautiful a psalm that is. And I know and I saw so many believers immediately, as soon as the plague started, began to quote this and confess this text, which is no, nothing wrong with that. It's the word of God. Stand on it. That's the whole point of these teachings, to get us to genuinely believe what God has said and stand upon it in the face of no matter what is coming our way. We stand on the eternal word of God, and we shall not be moved. So anyway, I wrote a long article on Psalm 91, and all that God has promised to those who dwell not visit, but dwell under the shadow of the Most High. And he shall deliver his people who do so from pestilence. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Verse 10, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague COVID-19, bubonic plague, Ebola, Zika, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Well, why is that? Because your dwelling happens to be the most high. Go back to the very beginning of the psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And then verse 10 says, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Why? Again, your dwelling is under the very wings of Yahweh, the risen Lord, the Christ of God, Jesus. Okay. So if now there was ever a time for you and I to be established on the physical healing promises in the Bible, it is now. Brothers and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ is still our great physician, and his power has not waned. And in this time of shortages of medicines, and in the article I, I put a footnote note with a link, just Google it. And you'll find out how many medicines are short in America, are not on the shelves, are backlogged. We're talking hundreds of them because they come to us from China and from India. And due to the supply chain breakdown that our nation and all nations are experiencing, we are not getting many of our pharmaceuticals because we don't make them here anymore. So now we're in a time where medicine is hard to get, just physically. You could have all the money in the world, and it doesn't matter, because if they don't have your insulin in your city, they don't have it. I don't care how rich you are. 
So, when these times come, whether you have money or you don't, or they're just simply or not available, we had better know how to believe God's word and take a stand on his veracity, that our God does not tell lies, that his word is fully to be trusted by us. Let's go on. Yahweh gave his word to his people while they were in the desert regarding physical healing. And again, as I say, he has not changed. He has not abrogated any of his promises. He has not done away with them. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. And, and highlight this in yellow if you've got a marker or a pencil. Underline this. Commit it to memory. If you will diligently listen, which means to do, to obey. If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. Here's the point. For I am the Lord your healer. A lot of places translate that from the Hebrew Jehovah Sidkenu or Jehovah Rapha, excuse me. The Lord our healer. Now there is no J in the Hebrew. It's really better translated Yahweh, Rapha, maybe Adonai, Rapha. But it's the Lord our healer. God reveals to his people something of his character in each of his divine names we'll look at that in a minute but Yahweh makes it perfectly clear in Deuteronomy chapters 28 and 29 what the blessings of obedience are and what curses will follow those who rebel and walk contrary to his given word Okay, and God has not changed. He still blesses our obedience and our disobedience brings his chastening into our lives and places us out of his kingdom of grace, if you will, into the kingdom of our enemy, into the kingdom and camp of the rebellious. So God blesses obedience and he curses disobedience, always has, and he hasn't changed. Even though we're Christians and in Christ and in the church, he still blesses obedience, the doing of his word, and he still chastens us when we rebel and disobey. So even in this fallen world, the sicknesses and diseases we experience due to our own sins and foolish actions, we find are often relieved by the mercy and grace of our loving God. The psalmist knew Yahweh as a forgiving God and healer when he penned, who forgives all your iniquity, deals with our sin, who heals all your diseases. Psalm 103, verse 3. And healing is just one of his many benefits. The psalm says, forget not all his benefits. And many Christians today, especially in America, I don't know about Uganda and throughout Africa and, and the rest of the world, but in America, many Christians simply do not believe that God is still a supernatural being. They really don't. When they get sick, they immediately run to the doctor. They immediately run to the medicine cabinet. They immediately look for a drug or a pharmaceutical or something, some elixir to heal them, to deliver them. And I'm not saying that God doesn't use those things in his common grace. But my thing here that I want you to see in Exodus 15:26 is that God has promised that he will put none of the diseases on us that he put on the Egyptians, that he is the Lord, our healer, that he not only in Christ forgives all, all our iniquity, but he also heals all our diseases. Now, it's amazing to me how many Christians, especially Lutherans that I've come out from, 
will look at things regarding physical healing and relegate it to uh, spiritual rebirth, renewal, and restoration, and not physical healing for today. They really do not believe that God heals people physically today. Prove me wrong, Lutherans. How many of your pastors have healing services? How many Presbyterians or Methodists or Baptists? Well, some Baptist, Baptocostals may do a little more than Presbyterians or the mainline dead demon denominations. Yeah. When was the last time you ever saw someone receive physical healing in a Lutheran service, in the LCMS, after receiving communion, stand up from the altar and go, glory to God, it's gone. My, my, I had this lump on my arm here and, and, I, and, and, I, and it's gone. Jesus healed me. Thank you, Lord. I, I knelt down here and I received his body and blood and I said, Lord, I know you're here. Please heal me. And, and it's gone. They don't, they don't believe that God does that anymore. That never happens in any of their churches. I don't care how pious their pastors are, and I've sat under some of the best pastors the LCMS has to offer today. And they don't believe 10 cents worth of nothing about the power and presence of God, really. Who forgives all your iniquity. Oh, we're well established. Our sins are forgiven. But then he says, and heals all your diseases. Well, that has to be spiritual. No, the psalmist already stated, he dealt with all your iniquity. Now he's talking about healing, physical healing, all your diseases. My brothers and sisters, you can trust the Lord and stand on his word and remind him of who he is. Not that he's forgotten. We've either forgotten or never known him to be the Lord our healer. Blue Cross is our healer, not the old rugged cross. We look to Dr. Kildare and not the great physician, Dr. Jesus. We run to and fro to the Mayo Clinic. We look for the latest technology. Instead of simply coming before the living God who loves us, who has redeemed us, who has come to inhabit and indwell our physical bodies, and ask him to heal these bodies, that's somehow extremism and mysticism and nonsense. No, my friends, that is standing on the word of God, and it pleases our Heavenly Father. And all who stand in faith will receive the answer to their prayer. Because we are all familiar with Psalm, Isaiah, I should say, 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. And again, as I've said, many Christians relegate this text to mean spiritual healing and the restoration of our souls. Well, the atoning death of Jesus Christ most certainly accomplished this and much more. But there is absolutely no biblical rationale or theology that excludes physical healing in the atonement as well. Look at it this way. Won't the resurrection of our bodies be the ultimate, in quotes, physical healing and restoration? Well, I most certainly believe it is. And by that fact, we can trust that he is paid for our physical healing as well as all else that humanity lacked due to our fall on his cross at Calvary. Jesus has provided for everything we have need of, my brothers and sisters, not just spiritual things, natural things as well, including a forthcoming physical resurrection from the grave. And we believe that without any reservation, or we should. Yet when it comes to physical healing, I don't know. Well, when you die, do you believe you're going to heaven? Oh, without a doubt, absolutely. I love Jesus. He's my Lord. I trust in him. All my sins have been washed away by his blood. 
Oh, you can't shake a Christian, a true Christian from that. We're well established in that, and we should be. All I'm saying is the same God that's going to take you to heaven is the same Lord that healeth thee, and he dwells on the inside of you. He's not a billion light years away in some spiritual location called heaven. Oh, he's there, but heaven's a lot closer than you and I realize. Oh, it's just simply another dimension. It's not a planet. It's not somewhere billions of years way off. And when we pray, it takes hours for it. He is in us. He is with us. And heaven is very close to us. We are connected to it. All right. Why aren't we as established in God's willingness to heal us as we are in his willingness to raise us from the dead? Well, the atoning death of Jesus accomplished everything we need spiritually and physically. Now, I'm sure that we're all familiar with the account of King Asa. We know the account where King Asa became diseased. I'll quote, And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. Second Chronicles 16 and verse 12. Read this event. And we know what befell King Asa in verse 14. He died. Now the seer comes to the king and he reminds Asa that when he relied on the Lord, when he trusted Yahweh in verse 8, the Lord delivered his enemies into his hands. So Asa knew that God had delivering power, that he could save by the few. But he wasn't steadfast, and his heart turned back to trusting in man's provision. And in this case was Syria in verse 7, and the physicians in verse 12. And he paid the price. Make no mistake about it. God's testimony is plain. Cursed is the man that maketh flesh his strength whose heart turns away from the Lord. Let me read that again. Cursed is the man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. That's what Asa did. He knew God could deliver. He knew God was almighty. But he chose to go and seek not the Lord, but the physicians. And this is exactly what many Christians do. They get sick, they immediately run to the doctor. And then when the doctor says, oh, Sister Jones or Honey Badger, uh, you're going to die. What you've got, uh, Ebola, you've got whatever, AIDS, you've got some horrible disease, you've got three weeks to live. Then Christians shoot what I call, and we call in America, the Hail Mary prayer. The, well, when all else fails, let's pray. Maybe that's all we can do now. And you hear it in movies, you know, they'll do everything, and then the, the guy will come out, look at the little family in the, the operating waiting room. All you can do is pray. They're in the hands of God now. We've done all we can do. And everyone, oh, 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 oh. prayer should have been the first thing, not the last thing. They, Asa didn't seek the Lord. He ran to the physicians and he died. Remember the little woman who spent all that she had on the doctors and didn't get any better, but got worse. Finally, she goes to Jesus, touches the hem of his garment. Power goes out from the Lord. She's healed and delivered. Praise God. Seek the Lord, my brothers and sisters, especially in these times of pestilence and plague and manifold diseases going around. So what's the point of the text here in Chronicles? Simply this, Yahweh would have healed Asa had Asa trusted in him as he had formerly. 
but he refused to do so. My advice, trust in our Lord, who is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals us. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of Yahweh's titles, which is sufficient evidence of who our God is regarding his people. He is our healer and everything else that we have need of. Yahweh promised to our father Abraham that he, Yahweh, would be a God to him. Read Genesis 17 verse 7, which implies that anything we can conceive of a God being able to do, Yahweh can do that for his people and he will do beyond what we can imagine and even think of and dream up in our heart, for he is the almighty God, and we must trust him and believe him that he is the Lord, our healer. God reveals himself by that title, by that name, that is his character, that is a great deal of who he is to us, his people. Moving on, prior to the resurrection of Jesus, the people of God were not permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Do you realize this? Throughout the Old Testament, the Spirit of grace came upon God's servant for a specific purpose, and then he lifted off of their lives. We read of this throughout the Old Testament accounts. Here, here's one. Consider Saul, for instance. He is sent by the Lord. He, gets, uh, he comes to a band of prophets that are prophesying as he gets into their uh, environs, if you will. He gets amongst them. He begins to prophesy. And that's 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 11. Or Samson. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, Judges 14 and verse 6. It's just a couple examples. The Spirit of the Lord came upon his servants, but he did not indwell them permanently. He came and he went. But now, post-resurrection, oh, God's Spirit has come to indwell God's people permanently. He is the down payment, if you will, of our future glorification. This is very plainly spelled out for us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. And yet 99% of Christians today have no idea, number one, of the reality of who indwells them, and thus, number two, what manner of people they ought to be and what manner of lives they ought to be living. Prove me wrong. I've mentioned this in almost every issue or topic that I write about. I cannot escape this. We are the mobile temples of the living God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. You and I could not be more united with the living God spiritually than we are right now. We are one spirit with our Lord. Memorize 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Verse 16 tells us that our bodies are temples of the living God, the Holy Spirit and that we are one spirit with the Lord. We've got to get to the place where we see, in quotes, Jesus every day before us in our brothers and sisters. Do you understand this? Never forget that how we treat others is exactly how we treat Jesus. Matthew 25 and verse 40 Paul learned this in person from the lips of Jesus himself when our master said to him, Why do you persecute me? Acts 9 verse 4. It was personal. 
Paul was out there just persecuting random believers that he could get his hands on. And Jesus says, Paul, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We've got to begin to see every one of our brothers and sisters as mobile temples of God, that they are indwelt by the living God. They have purpose in God's kingdom. We may not particularly even like the person, but nonetheless, we can love them and we must. Number two, we can certainly enjoy the gifts of God inside them. Number three, we can rejoice even though currently we may not get much value out of that individual, see much value in them. But God has plans for them a billion years from now in his kingdom. So they're important. Well, you may be saying, well, what has this got to do with physical healing, honey badger? And I say much in every way. When Jesus rose, he gave gifts unto the church, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they're lift, listed in two places, Romans chapter 12 and in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, and one of these gifts includes the gifts, plural, of healing. You find this in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 9. And as his spirit wills, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, not as man desires. So every believer is a charismatic Christian. Every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. That means every Christian has been given gifts, a gift or many gifts, plural, by the same Holy Spirit as he wills. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, not as we desire. We don't get to pick and choose. The good news is this, because God the Spirit indwells us, whatever the need is that we find ourselves in the midst of, we know, we know that the greater one indwells us. And because he is in us, whatever the need is that we face, he is more than able to meet it. And he can do so through us if we'll get out of the way, which means we must decrease and he must increase, just as the last prophet under the Old Testament, John, said. So every Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and thus every Christian can be used by our Lord in healing the sick. This is not to say that every Christian will be used in this way, and nor am I saying that God will always heal whomever we want to be healed. But Jesus did say for his disciples to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Mark 16 verses 17 and 18. So obviously healing can only be possible when the Spirit of God flows through one of God's sons or daughters and heals the sick person according to his will for them. Now, I hope I'm not confusing you. I hope you're following me. I fully understand and have written against how massively the doctrine of divine healing has been abused in the church by frauds and charlatans and pimps for, well, since the beginning of the church, frankly, for 2,000 years. But I have spent over 20 plus years exposing these liars and frauds who abuse God's word. But get this straight, our abuse of God's word, our twisting and heresies of God's word does not change the fact that it is still God's word. And God's word tells me that my Lord Jesus is still the healer of all who trust him for their healing. And in these days of plague and sickness and lack of money and medicine, let us turn to the God who is with us and in us and look to him who is our refuge and strength and an ever-present help in trouble, Psalm 46, verse 1. 
he has promised to never leave or forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5. And he is most assuredly in our midst when we gather in his holy name, Matthew 18, 20. For he indwells all of his children. So as we gather in the name of Jesus, we can have faith that he is there. We know that he is easily touched with the feelings of our infirmity. So he knows that we are suffering. He knows that we are sick. He knows we don't have medicine. He knows we don't have money for the doctor. Or if we do have money, the doctor's not available. But during COVID, many doctors, our own, our own doctor just trying to get your annual checkup, was not taking patients, was not seeing people, was not taking any new patients. You could go to the emergency room and sit around 100 or 200 people that probably have COVID uh, while you go to get your annual physical. No, thank you. Uh, we have got to learn to turn to this one who indwells us, who's with us, who's in us, who's amongst us, and believe him. And so I want to close this section out with a reminder that during our Lord's earthly ministry, he never refused to heal anyone who came to him seeking healing, even the Syrophoenician woman, even after he called her a female dog. She responded in faith that even the dogs get the crumbs off the master's table. And he said, woman, thy faith, thy faith, you connected with me, you did it, you believed, you persevered, your daughter's well. But no, when sickness comes, many believers immediately run to the doctor or to some pharmaceutical for relief. And again, prayer for them is at best an afterthought, hope against all hope kind of plea. And many, at times, our Father, in his mercy, he responds in, in the affirmative and answers these prayers. Let's not be like those people. Instead, let us be among those who are growing in their walk with Jesus and who know him and trust him for our every need first and foremost. Let us be amongst them that cry out to our Father, looking to him to meet our needs through his Son by the power of his indwelling Spirit. Oh, I hear some people, but honey badger, what if we do this and we still perish? Yeah, this could happen. And I go, meh. There is still one death per person. Hebrews 9.27. Under the best of circumstances. So if given the choice, I want to go down swinging for the trees. Versus rolling up and giving over and running to the physician's. I'm going to believe my God, the God who loved me so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for me. I'm going to trust in Jesus who loves this honey badger so much. He was willing to, to, to suffer the shame and disgrace of being publicly executed for a sinner like me. Yeah, I'm going to trust the one that loves me that much for my healing. I'm not saying that God will not use common grace and that there's anything sinful about going to the doctor or taking medicine. Those of you who have heard this broadcast or heard the previous one on God will provide, I have not said anything about that. What I am saying, and I think this is the, the bottom line, and I want this to be the takeaway of this short exhortation, is that our God is able. Jesus Christ is our great physician. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
you can trust him to heal and deliver you from whatever illness and sickness and disease is attacking you. They are not from the Lord. Think about, I mean, look at all of the cases. Go back and reread all of the examples in our Lord's ministry of healing. Remember the woman, and he says, Ought not this woman whom Satan hath bound all of these years be delivered? Another place he speaks of spirits of infirmity, spirits of deafness, dumb spirits, unclean spirits, spirits that cast the young boy into the fire or the water to kill him, all kind of spirits out there. And we have been given complete and total authority over them. And don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to us, but rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life in heaven. But nonetheless, the spirits are subject to us in the holy name of Jesus. And so when sickness and disease comes, rebuke it in his name. Look to the Lord, cry out to God. Don't make him your last resort. Make our Lord your first and foremost. And I believe as you do and you have done all to stand, he will come through. Like the three Hebrew boys going to be cast into the fiery furnace. Look, if I die, I die. If I get burned up, we get burned up. But we're not bowing our knee. We're not compromising our belief and our faith in God's holy word. His word is true. By his stripes I am healed. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Speak the word and they shall be healed. Is just as true as John 3.16. And we must grow in our faith and be established in these truths. And the way that we do this is to hear them, to study them, to meditate upon them, and to act upon them when sickness and disease comes against our household or our congregation or our community. We have every right as the ambassadors of the kingdom of God, as servants of the living God, empowered by no less than God himself, God the Holy Spirit, indwells us. Why are we living as mere men and women, Paul says? We're not mere men and women. We are actually supernaturally filled people. Whether we know it or not, whether our lives reflect it or not, God's word is still true. And all he is waiting for, I believe, is for you and I to trust him and to act upon it without reservation, without any plan B. True, abiding, genuine, biblical faith. And my God has never failed to respond in the positive to such believers. Just read Hebrews chapter 11. All right, guys. Dark days are coming. Dark days are here and darker days are yet ahead. We're in tribulation, heading towards great and greater tribulation. We've got to know to believe God. We've got to know how to trust him for our daily bread. We've got to trust him for our physical healing. And he has provided, in this article that I've written, I have uh, cite over 100 verses from the Bible in a simple three-page article. And I have just scratched the surface. But that's all our readers can really handle. And that's all I can cram into the size of our newsletter. But there's that much faith-building material in our Bibles. Trust in the living God. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Call upon him, nothing doubting, and he will come through.